Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome out to the second Sunday of Advent. And I hope that you've been having a good week. And as we gather together today, uh, I want to remind you of a couple things. I haven't read this. You know, I have different things that I have written over the years that I think define who we are as Shade Tree Community Church. I haven't read this one in a while, so I'd like to do this as a reminder of our focus. Under the Shade Tree, we push aside partisan politics. We embrace the ongoing conversation of faith that begins in the Bible, and we resist the temptation to take the Bible simplistically rather than seriously. We embrace the contributions of science for the better of humanity, and we eliminate the fear of other religions and people groups. We condemn white supremacy and nationalistic justification for greed. We embrace the poor, outcast, and those on the margins. And we realize that everyone is encultured in the way they see the world. To see the world differently does not mean that it is wrong. We try to eliminate homophobia and hatred of other groups, often used as scapegoats. So if we can look to that as our objective, indeed, we just might be the prelude to peace on earth, goodwill toward men. This is a safe place where we can explore our faith together. And I'd like to begin this morning uh, with a word of prayer, and then I want to give you a couple of announcements, and then I'm going to tell you a little bit of what we're going to do in our time together this morning as we use a very unique uh, portion of scripture that is often overlooked during the Christmas season, but it is really a part of the birth narrative of Jesus. Would you join me in prayer as we begin our time, please? Heavenly Father, during this time of Advent, we thank you for the opportunity that is ours to gather together. We come together today to indeed seek your face and to explore your ways. We come together to be renewed by hope. We come together seeking to be peacemakers. We come together, Lord, desiring to know you and be known by your characteristic call that we might love one another as you have loved us. We ask for your blessing upon our time here this morning. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. So I want to remind you that um, the, we are coming toward the end of the year, and actually tomorrow night those who are on the board were meeting together, and we will be putting together the 2023 budget. So I want to remind everyone that uh, as we kind of wind down here, your gifts are greatly appreciated as we seek to catch up. We're a little bit behind our budget, but um, if you keep that in your prayers and over the next few weeks, if you want to give, there are several ways to do that. Two weeks from today, we invite you to stick around a little bit. We're going to have some refreshments and coffee and hot chocolate and stuff in the room next door to us, just as kind of a way to have some fellowship after our service and to wish each other a happy holiday and a Merry Christmas. Uh, I want to remind you that we will not be having in-person service either on Christmas Day or New Year's Day. I will be following up with this series that we are in online. So I'll pre-record that, I'll post that on uh, YouTube as well as Facebook. But I, we hope that you have a great holiday season as we think of uh, that unusual year. Uh, it always is unusual when uh, we who meet as the church on Sundays also are trying to juggle the holidays on Christmas Day and New Year's falling on the same Sunday. So I want you to stand with me and I want to give to you kind of a paraphrase from a uh, scripture passage. Would you please stand? And this comes out of the book of Luke chapter 1. And the book of Luke chapter 1 tells a story of an old man by the name of Zechariah. And you'll learn his story in a couple of moments, but at the end of his story, there is this beautiful song that was written. It's a collection of poetry from the Old Testament and it's called the Benedictus. I don't know if anybody has ever heard of that phrase or not, the Benedictus. But it was uh, paraphrased by N.T. Wright. And this is a great summation of it. Blessed be the Lord, Israel's God. He comes to his people. 
and bought them their freedom, salvation from our enemies, rescue from hate, to give us deliverance from fear and foes, letting his people know of salvation through forgiveness of all their sins. The heart of our God is full of mercy. That's why his daylight has dawned from on high, bringing light to the dark as we sat in death's shadows, guiding our feet in the path of peace. I'm going to have Emma and Corey come up, and they're going to lead us in the Christmas carol, O Come All Ye Faithful. And that's really what Zechariah's song is doing. It's calling to the rest of the people of Israel to join him in the promise that he has seen fulfilled in the birth of his son in anticipation of the birth of Christ. I have waited a long time for this day. As a child, I watched my father offer sacrifices in the temple. My father was a priest, as was his father and grandfather, going all the way back to Abijah, the grandson of Aaron, the first priest of Israel. My father came from a long line of priests, so of course he became one too. And one day, he was chosen by Lot to burn incense on the golden altar in the inner courtyard of the temple. This was a great privilege. There were about 18,000 priests in Jerusalem at that time, and each day only one of them was chosen to burn incense in the inner temple. On the day my father was chosen, he said to me, Zechariah, one day you too shall be a priest, and one day you will burn incense on this altar. That was 50 years ago. True to my father's word, I became a priest, and I did all the things a priest is supposed to do. For decades, I offered sacrifices, washed temple vessels, taught the law, and performed rituals of cleansing and purification for many people. But I have never yet burned incense on the golden altar in the temple. I am still waiting for that part of my father's promise to be fulfilled. At last, I am also still waiting for something even more important. All my life, I've wanted to be a father, to have a child who carry on the family legacy. Elizabeth and I were barely engaged when I began making a wooden cradle. The other priests laughed. They said, Zechariah, aren't you getting a little ahead of yourself? I said, wait and see. For years, I kept that cradle dusted and polished, 
ready for the child that never came. Eventually, other things got piled on top of it, and it was forgotten. Not long ago, I found it again. I took it out, looked at it, then I broke it up, and I used it to start a fire in the stove. The other priests were sympathetic, up to a point, but as time went on, they began asking questions. They said that a childless couple was a sign of God's punishment. They hinted that Elizabeth must have some unconfessed sin. They suggested that I divorce her and try to have children with someone else. But how did I know the problem wasn't with me? Besides, I couldn't divorce Elizabeth. I love Elizabeth. And I don't think God works that way. I don't think God withholds children as a punishment for sin. God has given children to far worse sinners than I and withheld them from those who were far more holy. Look at Abraham and Sarah. God promised to make Abraham the father of a great nation, but Abraham and Sarah were childless. Was God punishing them for some sin? I think not. I think God was waiting. God waited until Abraham was 100 years old and Sarah was 90 years old before giving them a child. Or look at Hannah. Hannah pleaded with God to have a child. She waited years and almost gave up before God answered her prayer and gave her Samuel. I know that God can give children to childless couples. God has proven that. But God does not seem to do such things anymore. It's as if a wall has been built between God and our world and no one can find the gate. Today I was chosen to burn incense in the temple. After decades of waiting, my name was drawn. My father's promise will finally be fulfilled. I had begun to doubt whether I would live long enough to see it, which makes me wonder if my father's promise could be fulfilled after all these years. Could God's promises also come true? I keep watching and waiting.
this gospel truth of all shall I feel, shall not fail. By his blood and in his name, in his freedom I am free. For the love of Jesus Christ, who has resurrected me. Last week, we started a six-week series called Adventure Awaits. We are in person for four of those weeks, and then two of them will be online on Christmas Day and on New Year's Day. Last week, we said that we are all waiters and watchers. We're all waiting for something, and we're all watching for someone. And so there are characters in the Advent story that we are looking at. Last week, we talked about the ancient prophets, and we talked about one in particular by the name of Isaiah. Today we're going to talk about an old man, and then next week a young woman, and then two weeks from today an angelic assembly, and then we'll finish this series with a group of weary watchers and starlit sojourners. So I want to review just for a second what we talked about last week because it kind of builds on one another. So last week we said that when we look at some of these Old Testament passages that are then attributed to Christ by the gospel writers in the New Testament, we often get the misperception that the prophets in the Old Testament were all like fortune tellers. They all had a crystal ball and can see what was coming down the line. What is true is that at times they were predicting some things that were coming, but they were more like economists that were predicting what's in the near future, what's within the next few years, not what's coming hundreds and hundreds of years later. And more often than not, the prophets were crisis managers, and they were calling the people back to the common good. So when you hear words like righteousness, uh, holiness, uh, those type of things are related not just to personal individuals, but to the common collection we call community. What does a community look like? And so... Isaiah, in particular, was this poet of profound imagination that envisioned a time when one would come that would lead the way in that, and he would then envision a new kind of community that worked for the common good. Well, so many of those poems seem to sound like Jesus that the gospel writers like Matthew and Luke will often dip into the book of Isaiah repeatedly and quote them and say this is ultimately fulfilled in the person of Jesus Christ. So you have kind of a near fulfillment in Isaiah's day, in Micah's day, and the other prophets, but then you have something that stretches farther that is applied to Christ. So when you summarize the prophets as a whole, we said when they looked at Christ, the New Testament writers, they said, ah, This is what we have been waiting for. This is what the prophets have been longing for. That in the days to come, God will be with us and his authority will be established and it will bring endless peace and the spirit of the Lord will rest on him to bring a fuller knowledge of God to the earth 
so that death may be swallowed up forever. That's about a concise uh, definition, as you'll find, of what the prophets of the Old Testament are trying to communicate. Well, today we come to an old man, and we heard a first-person account uh, between the worship songs of some of the setting of, uh, of Zechariah. Here is an old man who is married to a woman by the name of Elizabeth, and she could not have children. But in the book of Luke, chapter 1, it begins with these words, in the days of King Herod. And it should perk us up to the troublesome time that this couple lived in. The Roman Empire is in power, and King Herod was an individual that reigned over the territory called Judea. And he was an individual that became a king over this section after uh, being rewarded for his military service for the Roman Empire. Herod was a daring general and a great builder, but he was also a corrupt politician, and he was a paranoid king. And so a little bit later in the birth narrative, we see that when the wise men come and ask, where is the king that is born? He becomes paranoid and he enacts a genocide against uh, the young babies that were born. So it's a troublesome time. Herod would reign about 30 years, and yet this hope for a messianic king was still far away. It seemed as though they had waited centuries for this messianic king to come to relieve the people from oppression under Babylon and Medo-Persia and Greece and now Rome. And what we find is there's this couple, Zechariah and Elizabeth, and they had been serving the Lord. They were blameless, the text tells us. And what we find is that they have done so faithfully for decades. But as you heard in the first person narrative, you heard that they had longed and prayed for a child to come. And that child never came. And now they are old. And other people began to look down upon them and judge them because of their barrenness. Because it was a sign of judgment from God that if a woman could not have a child, then God must have judged that individual for some reason. But if they would only look back in the text of the Old Testament, we would see that the barrenness of a woman was often just a prelude to the blessing that would come when these older couples would have a child. And these older couples would then be able to see their child grow and make substantial contributions to the nation. So Zechariah is this old priest, an old man, and finally his turn comes to be able to offer incense in the temple. And what we find is as he encounters this opportunity that he had been waiting for a lifetime, there is something that happens. And what happens is he encounters an angel. Let me read. This is from Luke chapter 1. It says, In the time of Herod, the king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah and Elizabeth. And they were childless because Elizabeth was not able to conceive and they were both very old. Once when Zechariah's division was on duty and he was serving as priest before God, he was chosen by lot according to the custom of the priesthood to go into the temple of the Lord and burn incense. And when the time for the burning of the incense came, all the assembled worshipers were praying outside. Then an angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing at the right side of the altar of incense, and when Zechariah saw him, he was startled and he was gripped with fear. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah. Your prayer has been heard. Your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you are to call him John. And he will be a joy and a delight to you. And many will rejoice because of his birth, for he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He is never to take wine or other fermented drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even before he is born. And he will bring back many of the people of Israel to the Lord their God. And he will go on before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the parents to their children 
and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Can you imagine? He has this encounter with this divine being, an angel, we're told. In the next paragraph, we're told that this angel's name is Gabriel. And Gabriel begins this announcement with the phrase, do not be afraid. Your prayer is going to be answered. And I think the first thing to notice out of this story is sometimes the answer to our prayers are delayed. A delay does not mean a denial. Sometimes God answers them in a greater way than we can imagine, but sometimes, just sometimes, we have to wait on his timing. Now an angel appears before Zechariah, and he is afraid, and it's funny how we represent angels in our culture. You know, you have the hallmark Christmas movies, right? And the idea of the angel sometimes in Hallmark cards are little chubby babies, right? Or if not that, um, most of the angels I have seen portrayed in statue form look like most of them are on Xanax or something. They're, you know, they, uh, there's no expression to their faith, but face. But Zechariah has been waiting and longing and watching like all of us do in the course of our life. And when this angel appears, he is afraid. You know, angels, whenever they appear in the Bible, have the potential to scare the bejeebers out of people. So I don't know what this looks like, but what I do know is that it's almost the employee manual of the angel to calm those that are going to receive a vision down before they're told the content of that vision, and that's the case here. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Same thing will be said to Mary when we look next week at the angel that appears to her. So Zechariah has this good news that is told to him by this angel. But instead of just shutting up and nodding his head differentially to the angel, do you know what Zechariah does? He does a pushback on the message of the angel. The text goes on and says in verse 18, Zechariah asked the angel, how can I be sure of this? I'm an old man and my wife is well along in years. It appears that Zechariah knows better, right? He knows better because old women, even though in the Old Testament it's true that old women had children, yet he knows better that The normal story is, my wife's too old to have children. And then the angel does something interesting. He says, human, please. No, it's not in the text. But he does say, shut up. Listen. The angel said to him, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God, and I have been sent to speak to you to tell you this good news. And now you will be silent and not able to speak until this day happens, because you did not believe my words, which will come true at their appointed time. Zechariah, shut your mouth. Just zip it, Zechariah. You don't know what you're talking about. And so Zechariah will be in a timeout. For nine months. He will not be able to speak. And can you imagine when he is finally told that Elizabeth is pregnant, he has to sit in silence as he watches her belly grow, as he watches that baby move within her womb. There's nothing he can do to express his joy. He sits in silence. I ask myself this question. Why didn't Zechariah believe the angel who came and gave him this wonderful news? Was Zechariah reluctant to believe the good news that Elizabeth would bear a son because he thought she was too old? That's what he says to the angel. Or was it he thought 
his own story was finished. You see, he's burning altar in the temple, uh, burning incense on the altar in the temp- temple. And he probably is thinking to himself, I've waited my whole life for this. And this is my crowning moment. And he's looking back over his shoulder. And he's probably thinking, the best is behind me. There's no possible way for better things to be in front of me now. Possibly this is the high point, And I'll be satisfied with the opportunity to burn incense on the altar. His temptation will become the temptation of every one of us here in this room, depending upon how long we live. Those of us who are beginning to wait for our social security to kick in are beginning to look back on our life. We sometimes think our best is behind us now. And certainly as we grow old into our senior years, when our body slows down and when our mind gets a little bit confused, we begin to think the glory days have passed us by. Here Zechariah, I think, is looking back, and I think he's caught in the moment of thinking that what, has, what is best is behind. And it's a temptation, I think, that we all carry. Maybe, though, God needs to put us in time out every once in a while. Just to be quiet and to watch, and to wait. You know, maybe that becomes the kick in the butt that we need to remind ourselves that we still have a story in front of us. The story is not complete behind us. Maybe our biggest temptation is to think that my story is fixed in stone, rather than realizing that As I step into tomorrow, there's the possibility of things that I had never dreamed of. And I think Zechariah is stepping into a story that he never dreamed would come true. Maybe, just maybe, what we need to do is not think of our story so much in terms of history, but mystery that the days that we have left in front of us still can be filled with opportunities that we've never dreamed of. Maybe our story is ingrained within us. Maybe we didn't achieve some of the things that we wanted to achieve in life, and we think, well, this is my lot in life now. But the good news of the Christmas story isn't just about the birth of a baby on a starlit night in Bethlehem. It's about people like you and me looking back over our shoulders and seeing that even though maybe most of our life might be behind us, there is still a story in front of us. And what we find is we don't know where that mystery is going to take us, but what we do know is the expectation of a God who does marvelous and mysterious things is still out in front of us. And pulling us forward. Maybe, just maybe, there's a different story that is possible if we would sit down and shut up. Like Zechariah. Maybe if we'd be quiet enough to let God work within our spirit. Maybe there's a different story that is possible. Because God, I believe, is continuing to redeem his creation through means that we would never come up with on our own. This silence of Zechariah is a gift to all of us, really. In his silence, he got to see his story unfold around him that he would never have dreamed up by himself. And maybe your story is also in process, that what has already occurred in your life is not the final addition. Maybe it's just the prelude of the continued writing of God's story into tomorrow. You know, I really do believe that true worship is believing in the possibilities of God. 
the possibilities of things that maybe we have shut down because of our fear or frustration or hurt. You know, worship isn't stroking God's ego as though God has some low self-esteem and has created us to remind us how great he is. Worship is encountering the divine and it's living into this beauty of what is still possible because God is still speaking and working even in our day and age. And maybe what our world needs more than anything else is not people that are full of opinions, but people who are full of dreams. In Advent, we step away into the mystery and awe of God's dreams, and then we pray that it helps shape our own reality first, and then the future for the common good. Zechariah has a choice to make now. The text goes on. As we come to Luke chapter 1, verse 21, It says, meanwhile, the people were waiting for Zechariah and wondering why he was staying so long in the temple. When he came out, he could not speak to them. They realized he had seen a vision in the temple, for he kept making signs to them, but remained unable to speak. When his time of service was completed, he returned home. After this, his wife Elizabeth became pregnant and for five months remained in seclusion. The Lord has done this for me, she said. In these days he has shown his favor and taken away my disgrace among the people. Then the birth of Jesus is interrupted in this story, and then Luke comes back to it down in verse 57. When it was time for Elizabeth to have her baby, she gave birth to a son. Her neighbors and relatives heard that the Lord had shown great mercy to her. And on the eighth day, they came to circumcise the child. And they were going to name him after his father, Zechariah. But his mother spoke up and said, No, he shall be called John. They said to her, There is no one among your relatives who have that name. Then they made signs to his father to find out what he would name the child. And he asked for a writing tablet. And in that moment, he had a choice to make. Was he going to believe God and trust God and name that baby John, just like Gabriel had told him? He asked for a writing tablet. And to everyone's astonishment, he wrote, his name is John. And immediately, his mouth was opened and his tongue set free. And he began to speak, praising God. And all the neighbors were filled with awe. And throughout the hill country of Judea, people were talking about all these things. Zechariah takes a pen and he writes it down. This baby's name is John, not Zechariah. And in that, he steps into this dream. He steps into this vision. He steps into this opportunity And then he breaks into a song. And it's called the Benedictus. And it's a quote of numerous Old Testament passages. Actually, in this passage of Scripture, uh, there are dozens of Old Testament references. It's like he takes all that's in the Old Testament and he works out this tapestry and creates this song. And you're going to hear it in a moment. I'm going to show you a video. Here is an old woman that has a new baby. And here is an old man that has a new vision. And maybe what we can learn from Zechariah is what I've written on the whiteboard. Old souls can receive new visions, but it might leave you speechless. Have you ever had those moments in your life where you needed a new vision for tomorrow? And you needed to trust God for that. And you don't know how it's going to come about. But when it all works out, you just scratch your head. How did all that come together? How were all the pieces put in place? You know, it doesn't matter what our age is. It's easy to become an old soul. Just kind of walking and 
treading the same path over and over again because that's what life does to us. It tramples us down onto the same path over and over and over again and rarely can we see into tomorrow with a new vision. And then we take a step of faith and we trust that God will do something in our family, in our workplace, in our church, in our nation. And what we find is that we too can go, go like Zechariah back into the Old Testament, see the story after story unfolding. And if we were to put together our own Benedictus, we might just match up Zechariah's 35 different Old Testament scriptures in this song. What we find, though, is this song is a song of great deliverance. It is a song of promise. And it is a song that reminds us that God has not left us. Even when we can't see into tomorrow, God is already there. So I ran across this song. I, I don't know who this individual is, but I fell in love with this song because I was looking for something to kind of summarize uh, verses 67 all the way down to verse 80 in chapter 1 of Luke. And I thought this does a great job of that. So we're going to watch this video, and then we're going to take the uh, Lord's table together. But I, what I'd like Mark to do is, would you shut those lights off? I think it'll, you, we'll be able to see this video and appreciate it better. Bless the God of Israel, God who comes and who redeems, who raised the Savior for the world, from David's house the promised King, that we should be saved, as the prophet spoke. His covenantal love, His mercy shown, His mercy shown. The oath He swore to Abraham has been granted unto us that we might serve Him without fear. In holiness and righteousness For we shall be saved From all our foes His covenantal love His mercy shown His mercy shown My child who prophesied will go prepare the way for him, making his salvation known in forgiveness of their sins. For we shall be saved from all our sins. With steadfast love, would mercy give, would mercy give the tender mercy of our God, the sunrise from on high shines its rays into the Guiding us into his light, for we shall be saved to a glorious light has dawned upon us in Jesus Christ, for we shall be a glorious life has done
stand upon us in Jesus Christ, in Jesus Christ, who blessed the God of Israel, the God who comes and who redeems, who raised a Savior for the David's house, the promised king. This baby that is born is not Jesus. It's John the Baptist. And John the Baptist will become the forerunner of the coming Messiah. And he will have a tough job. If you read the story of John the Baptist in the Gospels, you'll find that he's an individual that runs into a lot of trouble. He's finally beheaded by the powers of the Roman Empire. He gives his life as he's trying to challenge a nation. You see, it's not just individuals that can have an old soul. It's a collective of people as well. Judaism was stuck in the mire of a political messiah that would free them from their oppressor. And they didn't listen to John, who came and said, Behold, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. Maybe all of us, collectively, are kind of like old souls that need a breath of fresh air, new vision. And maybe we just need to shut up long enough to let God's Spirit stir that within us as a nation, as a family, as a church. And so Jesus provides a table for us to do that. It's called the Eucharist. It's called a sacrament. It's called the Lord's Table. It's called the Lord's Supper. There are various terms for it, but Jesus is also breathing fresh air built upon what he knows he's going to accomplish in the world. Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the world, a sin of the world. And then Jesus said, I lay down my life for you only for it to be taken up again in resurrection. So we come to the table, and we're reminded that on that supper that he enjoyed with his disciples long ago, he took a piece of bread and he broke it, and he said, this is my body given for you. And then he took a cup, and he said, this is the cup of the new covenant. New covenant? Yeah, new vision. It's in my blood. I'm willing to lay down the sacrifice needed for this new vision to take place. This new vision is called the kingdom of God. It's something that Jesus kept calling people to be a part of. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Behold, the kingdom of God has come. So as we take a piece of bread and as we hold it until we all have a peace, we're going to remember that Jesus gave his life for a new vision, that it might breathe new life into the world. If you'll take one and pass it around, please. Jesus also took a cup, and if you'll hold the cup at the same time, please. This cup is a part of an old vision that was given from long ago, part of the Passover Seder meal. But he infuses it with new life, this new opportunity to understand that the Exodus isn't just simply something historical that happened to one group of people in the past, but rather it is a new way of life the exodus available 
to everyday people like you and like me. Take the bread and hold it for a moment, and let's pray. Father, thank you for this wonderful time of remembrance and reenactment of your love for the world. We thank you for the body of Christ given for us. Thank you that we can see love incarnate, that we can envision what the love of God looks like in the person of Jesus. As we take the bread, Help us, like Zechariah, to have faith for tomorrow. For I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's eat together. A cup of wine, a cup of juice, something so simplistic, but something that represents the essence of the world in which we live, the provisions of God in the form of grape juice and in the form of wine. But Jesus takes it and applies it to his own life blood. That what he was bringing into the world, he envisioned giving his entirety for. And he holds up a cup at the Last Supper with his disciples. He says, this is my body given for you. Drink it in remembrance of me. Let's drink. As we close our time together, I want you to stand with me, please. I have a promise to give you. And the promise is for those of us who are past the halfway mark in our life, that the body gives up faster than the soul. Yeah, time wrinkles it and wounds it. And often time can make a caricature out of what we once were. But the soul is a sore loser. It, need, it needs more time to continue to live into tomorrow. And so God's Spirit still breathes on old souls with new dreams. Don't give up on those. Continue to step into them. And continue to trust by just slowing down enough and being silent enough to feel God's presence in you saying, I love you. I have not forsaken you. I love you. Tomorrow awaits a new day. Step into the new dawn. Heavenly Father, thank you for our time together and for this adventure that waits all of us as we step into the Advent season. We ask for your blessing upon the remainder of this season and upon the day ahead today. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you both, all of you, and uh, I hope you have a great week. Thanks.